Excuse me. May I sit here, please? If you like. Thank you. Good evening, sir. Would you like to see the menu? Oh, yes. I'm starving. <laughs> really starving. <laughs> Prices. I think I'll just have some water. Water? Yes. Only water? But you seem so hungry. <laughs> I'm saving my money for something special. My mother. Your mother? Well, she's not really my mother, actually. She's my grandmother, but she raised me. My real parents didn't want me. Oh, I'm sorry. But my grandmother is a wonderful woman. She has a laugh that can make the birds sing. <laughs> but she's been quite ill lately, and the hospital bills have been adding up. I just want to do my share. It's kind of tough for me because I was never very good with money. I just seem to take whatever the Red Cross pays me and I just give it right back to them. But I am going to help my Gram Gram. She is the one who taught me. It is better to be truthful and good than to not. Waiter? What are you doing? Waiter? Give this man whatever he wants. Oh, I can't let you buy me a meal. Nonsense. I'll have a double turkey sandwich on white, a side order of fries, one of those large knockwares, three bags of potato chips, a chocolate milk, and two beers. Why don't you have a beer? Three beers. Thank you. Hey, welcome to Hope, everybody. My name is Scott Raines. I'm one of the pastors here. And that's a clip from a movie called Dirty Rotten Scoundrels that came out around Christmas time, uh, my junior year of high school. I thought it was just hilarious. Steve Martin, Michael Caine, playing a couple of con men on the French Riviera, begging, stealing, and bartering their way to a life of luxury. And they don't particularly care who they hurt along the way because, after all, they are dirty, rotten scoundrels. Can we all say this together? Say this out loud with me. Dirty, rotten scoundrels. Uh, that's the phrase I think of when I read through this story in Luke chapter 5. Jesus extends an invitation to a tax collector named Matthew. He wants Matthew to come and be his disciple. And this is surprising and this is confusing because tax collectors are the dirty, rotten scoundrels of the Roman Empire. In fact, when you read through the Gospels, Often when the phrase tax collector shows up in the Gospels, there's an adjective, there's a word right before it, and it's the word despised. Tax collectors are despised, tax collectors are dirty, rotten scoundrels, and here's Jesus using a different D word for Matthew. We'll put this up on the screen, it was part of our Bible reading, uh, Luke chapter 5 verse 27, read it out loud with me, follow me and be my disciple. So Jesus doesn't refer to Matthew as a dirty, rotten, despised tax collector. He extends an invitation, be my disciple. And Matthew is so floored by this invitation, excited about this invitation to discipleship, that he throws a party and he invites Jesus to the party. And that makes things even more confusing, especially to the religious establishment of Jesus' day. The religious establishment of Jesus' day, they've been following Jesus for quite a while by this point in the story. Jesus is pretty well known, and there's a lot of conversation, and, and a lot of people are pretty convinced Jesus has been sent by God because he's doing miracles, he's healing people, he's teaching and preaching and announcing this really good news about the kingdom of God. Jesus has developed a reputation as a holy man. And so for the religious establishment, this idea of a holy man going to the house of a despised, dirty, rotten scoundrel tax collector and sitting down and sharing a meal with him, that was really concerning. And so they started to complain. And they bring the complaints to Jesus, and, and here's their complaint. Why do you eat and drink with such scum? 
That's how they viewed Matthew, tax collectors. Vile, dirty, <laughs> worthless. Stay away from them, whatever you do. Our theme this year at Hope is we want to be a church after God's own heart. And if we're really serious about being a church after God's own heart, we're going to have to pay close attention to how Jesus responds to this criticism. How does Jesus answer this question? And we'll put his answer up on the screen and let's read it out loud together. Healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners and need to repent. Again, if we're going to be a church after God's own heart, we've got to think carefully about what Jesus is saying here. At first glance, our temptation is to think, well, here's Jesus dividing people into categories, into groups. And he's saying there's a group of people like the Pharisees and like the religious leaders over here, and then over on the other side, you got people like Matthew. You got some people who are clean and some people who are dirty, some people who are righteous and some people who are sinners, some people who are healthy and some people who are sick. But when you look more closely at what Jesus is saying, you start to realize he's not actually dividing people into groups. He's saying people are people. There's just one category. Human beings created in the image of God, and some of us human beings are aware that we are sinners, and some of us are unaware. I read a story recently, a little bit of an illustration that hit kind of close to home because I could see this happening to me. There's a police officer who uh, pulled a driver over, asked for the driver's license and registration and insurance information. And while the driver was getting that and handing it to the officer, the driver was kind of confused as well. I, I don't understand what's going on. I didn't run a red light. I wasn't speeding. Why did you pull me over? And the officer said, I'm glad you asked. I've been observing you. I've been following you down the freeway for several miles now. And I watched as you in the left lane got really angry at the person who was just kind of camping out in the left lane going a little too slow. And I watched as you swerved around them and you shook your fist at them as you passed them. And then I watched a couple miles later, a car swerved in front of you, causing you to slam on your brakes. And I saw you again, angry, red face. And then when we got to the construction zone around the bridge and the traffic came to a complete stop, I watched you pound on your steering wheel, frustrated, angry, checking your watch, you're going to be late, whatever. And the driver's like, yeah, well, I did do all of that. Again, none of that is criminal behavior. Why did you pull me over? And the officer said, well, I pulled you over because I saw the bumper sticker on the back of your car that says, Jesus loves you and so do I. So I just assumed the car had been stolen. Because some of us are aware of our sin, and some of us are completely unaware. The religious leaders in Luke chapter 5 are unaware. The, Jesus will refer to them as hypocrites multiple times throughout the Gospels. Because what they say they believe and their actions are not in alignment. They say they follow God. They say they love God. They're going God's way. And in the same breath, they will call a, another human being scum. It's really interesting as you read through Luke chapter 5. Well, not just Luke chapter 5, the entire gospel of Luke. Tax collectors are one of the main characters. So Luke chapter 5, it's a tax collector named Matthew. And Luke chapter 19, it's a tax collector named Zacchaeus, the wee little man who climbs up in the tree so he can see Jesus. And Jesus ends up going to the home of Zacchaeus and sitting at his table and sharing a meal with him. In Luke chapter 18, Jesus tells us a story to try to help us understand we're really all in the same boat when it comes to sin. Jesus tells this story in Luke 18. I'll start reading in verse 10. Two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, the other a despised tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer. I thank you, God, that I am not a sinner like everyone else. I don't cheat, I don't sin, I don't commit adultery. I'm certainly not like that tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give you a tenth of my income. But the tax collector stood at a distance and dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow, saying, O oh God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. 
Oh God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. Here's a guy, this tax collector in Jesus' story, who is well aware of his need for God's mercy. He's well aware that he is a sinner. And Matthew, in Luke chapter 5, is aware as well. And that's why he's so surprised and and excited when Jesus extends this invitation, follow me and be my disciple. I wonder what you think of when you think of a disciple. What, What are the kinds of characteristics that pop into your mind that would help you know, oh, that person is a disciple, that person is a follower of Jesus? You heard the Pharisee in his prayer kind of going through a list of all of his righteous behavior, religious behavior that think, he thinks makes him right with God. And I think we have a temptation to do that sometimes as well. To be a disciple, to be a follower of Jesus just means there's the bad stuff I'm not supposed to do, and as long as I do more of the good stuff that I am supposed to do, that's what makes me a disciple. So I read my Bible, I pray, I show up for worship, uh, I put money in the offering plate when it comes by, and if they ask it to come by twice like we did for the front row today, it just means you didn't give enough the first time, apparently. (laughs) Oh, man, it's fun what you see when you sit up in the front. Anyway, um, We think this religious behavior, doing the right things, is what makes us a disciple. But when you look closely at at what Jesus is doing in his relationships with tax collectors in the Gospel of Luke, it becomes pretty clear the heart of discipleship is all about mercy. The heart of discipleship is all about mercy. Oh God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. Matthew understands this. So when Jesus calls him to be a disciple, he is super excited about this because he's experiencing the mercy of God. Everyone else around him is saying, stay away from this guy. We don't want to have anything to do with him. But Jesus extends the invitation, be my disciple. He is so overjoyed by the invitation that Matthew throws a party. How about you? When's the last time that you were overwhelmed by the goodness and mercy of God in your life? When's the last time you just had this stark realization, this just this vivid understanding deep in your spirit, oh my goodness, it's the mercy of God that has forgiven me of my sins. It's the mercy of God that has defeated death forever. It's the mercy of God that means heaven is my eternal home. I mean, that's good news. That's better than good news. That's great news. It's the kind of news that would fill us with joy like it does with Matthew and make us want to throw a Jesus party. (laughs) <laughs> Hello, skit team. Welcome. Oh, no. Yeah. Uh-huh. The circular breathing, I think, is what they call that, when you can keep playing even when your mouth's not attached to yes, the instrument. Yes, that's right. Circular yes. breathing, yeah. It took me years to master I this. Bet, yeah, very good, very good. So I, I'm guessing you guys heard me talking about the joy that the mercy of God gives us? That was the cue that you gave us to come out. <laughs> yeah, yes, it was. It was. Yes. You, you follow directions well this week, Nick. It's great. Just, just this week. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. So when we were talking about joy with the kids during vacation Bible school, we said, when we understand God's grace and God's mercy and God's love is for us, it fills our hearts with joy. And when our hearts are full of joy, it makes us want to sing. So we want to teach you the song that we taught the kids at vacation Bible school. So everybody, we need you to stand up for this one. Now, this one's a little different than most of the songs. Most yeah. of the songs, we take some crazy songs from the radio that need a little bit this of Jesus. This has never been on the radio. And redeem them. Yeah. Okay, yeah. some of you know what I'm talking about. That's not what this is. But if you've been around different. Hope for a while, you've maybe heard this one. If you're new, it's really easy. We'll just teach it to you. It goes like this. I've got joy, joy down, down in my heart, deep, deep down, down in my heart. heart. Spell it. J-O-Y, down in my heart. Deep, deep, deep down, down in my heart. heart. What are you you, you might wonder how it got there. Jesus, Jesus put, put it there and nothing can destroy it. Destroy it. Destroy it. Destroy it. Woo! I've, I've got, got joy down, down in my heart. Deep, deep, deep down, down in my heart. heart. Just like that. It's pretty easy. You, you think you can try it with me? Okay. All if right, you're you tough guys it, out there. We'll see how you're tough gonna you try are. It. Here we if go. If you're going to sing about the joy of the Lord, your face should surely show it. And some of you maybe haven't used your joy muscles in a while, so just be careful. Stretch them out maybe. We don't want any pulled muscles. You got the joy of the Lord? Are you feeling maybe a little bit? Okay. Here we go. Try it with me. I've got joy down in my heart. Deep, deep down in my heart. Spell it. J-O-Y down in my heart. Deep, deep down in my heart. Jesus put it there and nothing can destroy it. Destroy it. Destroy it. Woo! I've got joy down in my heart. Deep, deep down in my heart. They're pretty good, I think. Yeah, that's impressive. 
You are fast learners. Speaking of fast, the kids really like it when we try to sing it fast. You, you want to try that? Again, be careful. Don't hit people with the joy of the Lord while we're doing this one. So we have good insurance, but still. Uh, okay, we're going to try it fast on the count of three. One, two, three. I got joy down my heart. Deep down my heart. Spell it. J-O-Y down my heart. Deep down my heart. Jesus put it there. I got joy down my heart. Deep down my heart. You might find this hard to believe, but the person who can sing about the joy of the Lord fastest on staff is Pastor Ashley. Watch this. All done. She did it already. How? Yeah. So uh, we might need to watch that in slow motion instant replay just to make sure she got all the words and, and moves in there. So we're not actually going to watch it. We're just going to pretend like we're doing it in slow motion instant replay because we and love so Jesus and kids. And you will forget about this as soon as you will see this, right? You will not tell anyone what you're about to see. Well, join me in it. It'll be fun. Let's all do it. Are you ready? I've got joy in the back. Doubt in my heart. Yes, we see you. Deep, deep down in my heart. Spell it. J O Y. Doubt in my heart. Deep, deep down in my heart. Thank you for playing along, everybody. Thank, that's actually that's a recruiting tool. If you want to be on the skit team next year, we can do crazy things like this. Join us. Uh, all right. One of the things I notice when my heart gets full of the joy of the Lord, uh, I become breathless. So, yeah. <laughs> Whew. We were singing about the joy of the Lord that cannot be destroyed. But I wonder if you might agree that sometimes our joy leaks. You know, one moment we might be just absolutely full of the joy of the Lord, and then if we're not paying close attention, it feels like all of a sudden our joy tank is empty. One of the things that fills my joy tank is Vacation Bible School. Uh, last summer, I was on sabbatical, and so I was gone. I missed Vacation Bible School, and I didn't know how much I missed it. I didn't know how much I needed it. It's really an incredible thing. At the end of each week of Vacation Bible School, on that Friday closing worship session when the kids have been hearing the stories of God's love and God's miracles all week long and we've been learning the songs and learning the moves to the songs, when they're worshiping God at the end of a week of VBS, you can literally feel the floor in this room shaking as they praise God. And I forgot what a privilege it is to be up here when we sing. The closing song is always a prayer song. And the kids sit down and there's kind of sign language and and they fold their hands and they pray during a part of it. It's just beautiful. And this year, part of the prayer song included Psalm 23. I want us to read verse 6 out loud together. Read it with me. Surely your goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. The Hebrew word that gets translated mercy is one of the best words in the entire Old Testament. It's the Hebrew word chesed. It's got a hard H at the front of it. Let's practice saying that, but just be careful where you're aiming when you say ch. You can all say that? Ch. Now put it all together, chesed. Chesed gets translated mercy over and over throughout the uh, Old Testament. And my seminary professor, Dr. Della Martyr, Old Testament Hebrew seminary professor, he helped translate some of the Dead Sea Scrolls. He said if God had a bumper sticker, God's bumper sticker would be this verse, Exodus 34, verse 6, which says, Yahweh the Lord, the God of compassion and mercy, I'm slow to anger and filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. 
Because a lot of people have questions about God. Who is God really? What is God really like? And a lot of people have opinions about who God is and what God is really like. This is God's opinion. Moses says, up on top of Mount Sinai, show me your glory, and this is how God responds. This is who I am. I'm the God of compassion and mercy. I'm filled with unfailing love. And in Luke chapter 5, that's how Matthew experiences Jesus because this is also a description of Jesus. God as a human being is a God of compassion and mercy, slow to anger and filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. And as Matthew experiences that, as he experiences the Old Testament word said, the New Testament word is grace, is that fills him up and that fills him with joy. He throws a party because he experiences Jesus to be this kind of God. So part of what we learn when we look closely at this story, the heart of discipleship is mercy. A disciple is someone who experiences the mercy of God in their lives and then shares that mercy with the world around them. And that's the mission of this church. It has been for 30 years at Lutheran Church of Hope to reach out to the world around us and share the everlasting love of Jesus Christ. We also have a vision, and our vision is who we are praying for God to help us become. We want to become a church that's powered by the Spirit to bring Christ to all cultures, revive the world with God's love, and make heaven more crowded. Can we all say that together? Say it out loud with me. Powered by the Spirit to bring Christ to all cultures, revive the world with God's love, and make heaven more crowded. If, if you call hope your church home, I really do want to challenge you to make this a consistent prayer in your life. Pray that God would help you become the kind of person who can help this church become a church that's powered by the Spirit. To bring Christ to all cultures, revive the world with God's love, and make heaven more crowded. Uh, back in the fall of 2019, we were celebrating our 25th anniversary as a church, and we came up with something we call Hope's 10 for 10 vision, 10 big goals for the next decade of ministry. This is goal number 10, to be caregivers. And the description of a caregiver in the 10 for 10 vision is to love and support the hearts of those who are broken, broke, tired, scared, sick, imprisoned, lost, or wandering. When you look at this list, I wonder, can you think of a time in your life, maybe for some of you it's today, can you think of a time in your life where one of these words has been a good description of your situation, your circumstances? Broken, broke, tired, scared, sick, imprisoned, lost, or wandering. And I want to ask you, if it's true, at some point in your life this describes you, can you just raise your hand? Any point in your life, one of these things is a good description of you. Keep your hands up in the air just for a second. Some of you are aware and some of you are unaware. And some of you are new to hope. Keep your hands up just for a little bit longer. And, and hope has a reputation, and maybe some of you wonder, is hope a church for me? Is, is hope a place where I can belong? These raised hands are your answer. Put your hands down now. This church is filled with people who have experienced the mercy of God when we've been going through these kinds of times. And sometimes the mercy of God comes to us from caregivers in our church who at just the right time, in just the right way, help remind us that God's mercy is for us. And when we experience the mercy of God, we want to share that mercy with the people around us. We're far from perfect at this. We get it wrong pretty frequently. Um... Instead of calling Hope a perfect church, I think a better description would be to say we are a messy church, led by a messy pastor who hires messy staff members who recruit messy volunteers, and we invite our messy families and friends and neighbors and co-workers to come and be a part of what God's doing at this messy place because we have this steadfast belief that God's mercy is for the messy. Can I get an amen? amen. God's mercy is for the messy. And when pe messy people like you and me and messy people like Matthew get invited by Jesus into this life of discipleship, follow me, because of the mercy we've received, we want to share that mercy with others. And I want to take just a minute or two to thank you, Hope, 
for the way I've been observing you extend mercy this summer. Uh, this week on Thursday, we had a funeral in the reservoir for a 10-year-old boy named Max. Max's grandparents belong here at Hope Ankeny, and Max and his mom kind of bounce back and forth between Hope Elam and Hope Ankeny, and he loves Hope Kids, and he loves Vacation Bible School. And a couple of weeks ago, there was a car accident, and Max died. And his family came and asked, we know it's really busy, it's the middle of Vacation Bible School, but is there any way we could have his service here? And we knew it would take a whole bunch of people doing a whole lot of work to make it possible to, after our Jesus party in the morning, to make a space that would be the right kind of space for a celebration of life for a 10-year-old. But we did it because we believed that would be a way of extending mercy to a broken and grieving family. All summer long, volunteers from this church have been helping with a ministry called Love Lunches. There's more and more kids all the time in our growing community who don't have enough food to eat, especially during the week. And so Love Lunches, which has been around for a while, we partner with other faithful churches and the volunteers make the lunches and they go to parks in our city and they serve those lunches to kids who maybe wouldn't get lunch otherwise. We do it as a way of extending mercy. All year long, we do it through the Ministry of the Cupboard, our emergency food pantry, on Fridays, we serve bags of groceries to people from all over the county who can use some additional help, come from some messy situations. Uh, during vacation Bible school, we don't have room for the cupboard. And so the Fridays of the last two weeks, they've moved the cupboard out to the parking lot. Volunteers show up early on Friday morning and get the bags of groceries ready so the cupboard guests can come and, and still be helped. It's really messy, but we believe it pleases God to extend mercy in the middle of the mess. Uh, you heard Nick mention during announcements one of Hope's mission partners is Prison Fellowship. And uh, Prison Fellowship, we're collecting uh, school supplies for people who are part of the Angel Tree Project. That was something that we did the last couple of years at Christmas time. Families who have parents or grandparents who are incarcerated, they, uh, the incarcerated individuals apply to be a part of this uh, Angel Tree Project. Uh, project, and then we adopt those families and provide Christmas gifts for them, throw a Christmas party for them, and it's really messy, but it's awesome. And so we're doing this um, a school supply drive for those families, and, and for any family that's going to need some help with school supplies. Uh, we offer a class through Prison Fellowship called Outrageous Justice. A bunch of people have taken that class, and some of those people have been trained to be teachers uh, for a program called the Academy that Prison Fellowship uh, leads in um, uh, correctional facilities all across the country. And I wanted you to know that this summer, on Tuesday nights, a group of hopesters have been going to Mitchellville, to the Iowa Correctional Institution for Women, and they've been leading that class. And uh, it's incredible the stories that we're starting to hear. There's a woman who's got a life sentence. She's already been in prison for 20 years, and she's taken the class, and she's telling our hope people she's feeling more hope than she has for decades. The, the women are talking to each other about what they're learning in the class. It's a transformational class, and they say they can feel the transformation and they can see the transformation in others. And, and the women who aren't part of the class uh, this time are wondering when's it going to be offered again because they want to be a part of it. God's on the move even behind bars because you are a church that's willing to extend mercy because you are a church that knows you have received mercy. It's part of what it means to be a disciple and to say yes to Jesus' invitation to follow him. Again, when you look closely at the call of Matthew to be a disciple, one of the things you see is there's a connection between mercy and a meal. And we actually see it all over the place in scriptures. But here in Luke 5, the, the religious leaders, blinded by their self-righteousness, they are convinced Matthew is undeserving of mercy. But Jesus is convinced God's mercy is for everyone. And to prove it, he goes and sits at a table in Matthew's home, this despised, dirty, rotten tax collector, and shares a meal with him. Again, throughout the Bible, we see this idea that mercy is a, uh, a meal is a metaphor for mercy. We see it in this passage in Isaiah chapter 25. I just want to read this for you. On this mountain, the Lord of heaven's armies will spread a wonderful feast for all the people of the world, all the people of the world. It'll be a delicious banquet with clear, well-aged wine and choice meat. 
On this mountain, he, the Lord, will remove the cloud of gloom, the shadow of death that hangs over the earth. He will swallow up death forever. Uh, if you're like me, that sounds a little bit like passages we read in the book of Revelation that's talking about heaven. That's what Isaiah is talking about. God's going to spread a feast for everyone. All the people of the earth are invited to come and sit at the table with the God who has the, the power to conquer death. It's a picture of heaven. How do we get to heaven? Not by our good deeds, not by our good works, but by the mercy of God. That's Hope Mountain. As we get ready to wrap up, I want to show you a video clip from my current favorite TV show. It's a TV show called The Bear. Uh, season three of The Bear was released about a, a month ago. Emmy nominations came out a couple of weeks ago, and because the timing is a little messed up, the Emmy nominations that just came out are not for season three, but for season two of The Bear. And season two of The Bear got more Emmy nominations than any TV show ever, which just shows I have really good taste. <laughs> it is not a family-friendly TV show. Uh, it's a TV show about really messy people and mercy and really good food. Carmi is the main character. He uh, moves back to Chicago. He's been a world-class chef at some of the best restaurants in the world, but he moves back to Chicago to take over the family restaurant after the death of his brother, Mikey. You talk about people who are broken and broke and lost and wandering and scared and tired, like pretty much every character on uh, this show is messy. And in this particular scene we're going to watch, it's from uh, season one, they're cleaning up the, the restaurant, and Carmi discovers a note that his brother left for him before his brother died. He opens up the envelope, and uh, on one side of the note is a recipe for spaghetti sauce. His brother wants him to make a family meal. Not a family meal that you go to grandma's house to eat, but a family meal that all of the employees at the restaurant they make and they eat it before they serve others. They receive and then they serve. As you watch this clip, I want you to be thinking about who are the messy people in your life? Who are the people you're finding it hard to extend mercy to these days? I want you to remember the mercy God has extended to you, that God gives you a place at the table and what might it look like for you to pull up another seat at the table. Take a look. Who's our family? I got it today, chef. Housekeeping chefs. Yes, yes chef. chef. Thank you. 